So hello everyone and welcome to the second webinar in the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's Circle Economy webinar series. And today we will be talking about the climate change and the circular economy. And we know that the climate crisis is one of the biggest challenges that we will continue to face collectively in the upcoming years, in, irrespective of our own societies, industries or geographies. And we also know that we will have to shift to the renewable energy and increase our energy efficiency if we want to tackle this challenge. However, our recent report on the climate, the climate paper that we called Completing the Picture, How the Circular Economy Tackles Climate Change, shows that this would not be enough. So in order to achieve the United Nations climate targets to keep the temperature rise below 1.5 degrees centigrade, we need to transform the way we design, make, and use products and food. In other words, transitioning to a circular economy would allow us to address the needs of the growing global population while ensuring that our economy is prosperous and resilient and is able to run in the long term, while also addressing the challenge of the climate. So in this webinar today, we're going to talk about the linkages between the circular economy and the climate, or in particular, how the circular economy can help us reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And we will also sh share some examples with you. And we will start by going through a brief presentation to share the key, report, the key insights from our paper, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers, which means that we do want you to ask the questions that you have or that may pop up while listening to the conversation. And you can do that by typing your question in the chat box that you can find in your Zoom window. And this webinar will also be recorded, so you will be able to re-watch it or share it with your friends after we finish. So my name is Ilma and I'm from the Foundation's Learning Team that brought to you the newly published Learning Hub on our website. And I'm very happy to be joined by my colleague Suki today, who is the project manager and lead author of our climate paper. So welcome to the webinar, Suki. It's great Thank to you. have you here. Thank you for having me here. And just to begin, so why this paper and why now? So as we all know, we're in the middle of a climate crisis. And if we leave this unaddressed, this will have serious implications for the natural ecosystem, for humanity. These are issues that we're very much aware numerous publications have been made on this topic it's on the news every day um, so what we really need are solutions that really help us transform the way the global society functions but also help us transform how we interact with our planet's resources and so this is really critical if we want to meet the 1.5 degree target that was set in the paris agreement and so what we try to do in this paper is really hi is highlight how the circular economy plays a, an important role. It is part of the solution, and it is critical if we want to meet this 1.5 degree target. So in the making of this paper, we collaborated with Material Economics. Uh, Material Economics is a consultancy. They are based in Stockholm. They have an expertise in sustainability. Um, what we wanted to do is, in this paper, we haven't necessarily created new, new uh, data necessarily. What we've done is created a synthesis of previous reports that have been published by Material Economics and by the Foundation. So Material Economics has, for example, published a number of reports looking specifically at Europe mm -hmm. and looking at how a circular economy can help reduce greenhouse gas emissions in industry. And the Foundation has this year published a report on food and looking at what a circular economy could look like for cities when looking specifically at food systems. And there we have also published a number of data points around greenhouse gas emissions. So the paper is a synthesis of these papers. We bring in together industry and food, and we are extrapolating the, the data globally, and then showing, and we're trying to really illustrate how a circular economy can help reduce these greenhouse gas emissions and why it is critical that we look at material flows as well. Mm -hmm. And we will get into the findings of the paper in a minute, but before we do that, perhaps it's worth reiterating why there is such an urgency to deal with the climate. Yeah, so um, I have a slide that I would like to share with you, which I think is a, is a great way of illustrating why the urgency today. Um, so what you see here is a graphic from the United Nations program. They published a report in 2018 called um, the Emissions Gap Report. 
So what you see here on the top line is the, the, the continuous increase in greenhouse gas emissions in a no policy baseline. The current policy scenario is slightly better. And then when we look at this, uh, these two lines, um, sorry, I'm trying to click to the next slide, but um, you see a red line and an orange line, and these represent the ambitions that are set today uh, by co uh, countries that have um, signed the Paris Agreement. And so these are the ambitions that we have today in terms of meeting these climate goals. So what is clear is that there's this huge gap, an emissions gap of, um, uh, of 30 billion tons CO2 equivalent in 2030. So we are not there yet. It really illustrates that the ambitions that we set today are not enough. And so in this next slide, uh, if we look to the 2050, because that goal for 2050 is to reach net zero emissions, mm -hmm. this emissions gap just increases exponentially. So the world is still not close to being on track to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. And so this is really part of the way the economy works today. You know, the economy today is very, uh, we call it the, the linear take make waste economy. It's um, heavily extractive, it's resource intensive. And this is emitting the greenhouse gas emissions that is causing what we are experiencing today as the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. But there is so much done with the renewable energy and increasing the energy efficiency. So how come that is not enough? So renewable energy and, and energy efficiency, I would like to say, you know, it's critical for us to meet this 1.5 degree target. A lot of work has been done on that front. There's a number of reports uh, published around this. And um, basically, um, when we look at renewable energy and energy efficiency, um, it has been said that they can contribute to around 90% of the energy, um, en the energy re emissions reduction potential in 2050. Also, the cost of, of producing renewable electricity is now lower than fossil fuel alternatives which is a huge progress already. And when we look at renewables, they are projected to supply around 60% of electricity in 2050. These are um, very ambitious and very promising um, um, trends and, 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 and innovations that are taking place. What we're trying to emphasize in the paper is that although it is critical and very important, it's just not yet enough to really help us meet this 1.5 degree target. And this is where we try to emphasize on, on, in the paper. The reason for that is that renewable energy and energy efficiency, they can help us tackle or help us address 55% of today's global greenhouse gas emissions. So if we look at all the emissions that are emitted today, 55% um, come from the energy sector, and this can be tackled by renewable energy and energy efficiency. So now I'm gonna sh show a few slides to help uh, explain this in a bit more detail. But what we mean with the energy sector is, uh, for example, energy systems. So these are the emissions that come from burning fossil fuels for the production of electricity and the production of heat. It's about the emissions that arise when you're burning fossil fuels when you're in transportation. So when you're driving your car, for example. And also emissions in that take place when you're from the burning of fossil fuels for heating your homes, for cooking, for lighting. All of that <clears throat> are formed part of the energy, energy sector, that 55%. And here, renewable electricity can help uh, tackle all of these emissions. As right? well as energy efficiency. Obviously. Energy efficiency as well, yeah. So then the question remains, you know, what about the remaining 45%? And so the remaining 45% comes from the production of goods and materials and how we manage our land. And this is more difficult to tackle with renewable energy and energy efficiency. So that 45% constitutes of industry. So here we're talking about producing materials like metal, cement, aluminum, plastic. Um, and so really the energy is the consumption of energy in the production of those materials. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we've got Afulu. Afulu stands for agriculture, forestry, and other land use. So you've got also emissions that arise through deforestation and also in the production of our food. So this gives you an illustration of what that 45% is. And this is particularly challenging to tackle with and renewable why energy. Why is it difficult to challenge, to tackle? The challenge, uh, 
here is, is the fact that when, so to give you an example, steel, um, steel requires uh, for the melting and the heating of steel, um, basically you need temperatures of a, a, around 1000 to 1600 degrees Celsius. It's very high and currently, um, although there's a lot of advancement uh, around renewable electricity, um, this is still very challenging to meet. These temperatures are very high and currently we're still very much dependent on fossil fuels to help reach these high temperatures. Um, and although there are certain technologies in place, um, it's not yet financially sustainable and not everyone has these technologies in place. It makes it particularly challenging. Apart from that, materials like cement or steel, what the chemical makeup, so the processing, the chemical processing that arise in making iron, so turning iron oxide into iron, requires carbon. Um, the calcination of limestone to produce cement emits CO2. This is part of the chemical process. And this is something that's very hard to avoid um, uh, and therefore um, are difficult to tackle. And when we look at agriculture and well, deforestation for one, for example, it means that you're no longer sequestering carbon, the CO2 mm -hmm. remains in the air. And when we look at food, you know, there's a huge amount of uh, food waste generated. Uh, and we still rely a lot on practices that disturb the soil, which then leads to CO2 emissions. So this is very difficult to tackle with renewable energy and energy efficiency. And to help illustrate this point further, I have this slide um, here. What you see on this bar graph on the left um, is basically the carbon budget that we have if, uh, if we want to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees by 2100. This carbon budget is for energy and industry. It's an estimation of the carbon budget. And what I mean with carbon budget is uh, the carbon budget is the maximum amount of CO2 we are allowed to emit if we are to limit the temperature rise to 1.5. So this is only for energy and industrial emissions or across all emissions? Only this is an estimation made only for the energy sector and the industrial, industrial sector. Yes. And the next bar graph here, what you see here, this is what we've calculated uh, or material economics has calculated. If we look at just four materials, so steel, cement, aluminium, plastic, if we look at the production of only those materials, um, and we look at it from the best case scenario with zero carbon energy, and with the best available energy efficiency technologies we have today, we will still exceed that carbon budget. So to clarify, you know, these are the four materials. We haven't looked at we haven't even modeled the other materials, nor the emissions that would arise from the energy sector. So just the production of those four materials will lead us to exceed that carbon budget. And this is to emphasize that, yes, that 55% that I showed earlier on is important. But if we don't tackle how we produce materials, we may not reach this 1.5 degree target. We need to look at the complete picture and not forget that the production of materials in itself emits a lot of CO2. And if we don't have the best energy scenario, the CO2 emissions would be even higher, right? The next exactly. Yeah. yeah, so here, this is uh, in, a, in a less ambitious scenario where we're just looking at energy efficiency, we exceed that carbon budget even further for those four materials. Um, so yeah, so this gives you a bit of, um, an indication of the urgency and the challenge that we have mm -hmm. in place. So maybe let's pause here and see if there are any clarification questions that need to be answered and uh, one of them so it relates to the United Nations targets and the question is what is the difference between conditional and unconditional NDCs? Um, the conditional ones are a bit more binding so they they have often also regulations in place policies in place and they tend to be more ambitious the unconditional ones are slightly less binding mm -hmm. yeah any other clarifying questions? No. Um, all right, so renewable energy is not enough. So how can circular economy come into the picture and help us tackle the production of these materials? Um, so here, you know, with the circular economy, we take uh, a particular material lens. We, we talk about renewable energy as well as just forming the way we produce goods. And I, I think it's important to, to emphasize that uh, when we talk about the circular economy, we tend to say, or we, well, it's an intrinsic part of the concept is that the circular economy is underpinned 
by a transition towards renewable energy. So that helps us tackle that 55%, right? That, it's, that is where, where it comes into play. And a circular economy is also about um, redesigning uh, supply chains or redesigning our system so that uh, we transform the way we make things and the way we use things. And that helps us tackle the overlooked emissions, everything that has to do with the making production of food and, and, and buildings, cars, and materials. And so in the next slide here um, is to help explain how does the circular economy reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So on the left hand side, you see the three key principles, design out waste and pollution, keep products and materials in use, and regenerate natural systems. And um, so with designing out waste and pollution, so you have to imagine uh, avoiding waste generation across the supply chain. This is about, uh, you know, designing products with less material. One of the main impacts is reducing greenhouse gas emissions by avoiding waste. You are avoiding incineration in landfill. So the associated emissions there mm -hmm. by, by avoiding um, over specification, for example, so designing with too much material or when it's not needed, you, uh, you, you, your material input is less. Therefore, the emissions that would otherwise have been associated with new production is avoided. Then keeping products and materials in use is about designing products that you can keep, keep circulating within the economy. So designing products that you can easily remanufacture, recycle, but also use business models that stimulate sharing and renting. When you do that, all the energy that went into making that product is, is circulated within the economy, but the energy is also, the embodied energy is preserved for longer. And then we've got regenerate natural systems. And here, this is about using natural practices that, that can help um, maintain and preserve the, the carbon sequestration uh, of, of potential of, of soils. Um, so here we've got the butterfly diagram. Mm -hmm. So maybe it would be useful to use the butterfly diagram and to go through a couple of examples. And just to reiterate that our butterfly diagram represents the systemic approach to circular economy by looking at the material flows and dividing these material flows into two broad categories, the biological side or the left side. So all the materials or nutrients that can be safely returned to soil and which we should aim to return them safely back to soil and then to the technical side where we have materials and components and parts that we should aim to keep out of landfill for as long as possible, actually eliminate the landfill option at all. So that is by sharing and reusing, by repairing, redistributing, refurbishing and remanufacturing and eventually recycling. So making sure that we continue circulating these materials and mm -hmm. components. So could you give us an example of how circular economy could help reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in the technical cycle and in the biological cycle? So if we look at the right hand side, I think a good example is, is the production of a car. Mm -hmm. um, so if we look at the first principle, which is design, uh, designing out waste. So it's about thinking about using, uh, when you're producing a car, make sure that you don't have the, the amount of scrap material that's produced is reduced and kept to a minimum. By, uh, so you're avoiding waste, waste generation across the supply chain. It's also about designing cars with less material where possible. So that so this whole aspect of material efficiency means that you need less material to do the same performance. When you do that, um, you avoid new virgin material production, but you also avoid incineration and landfill. And this is where you can avoid greenhouse gas emissions. When we talk about keeping products uh, and materials in use, here the loops on the right hand side really help illustrate this. So designing cars that you can uh, reuse, uh, remanufacture, and that you can recycle the materials as a last resort. Um, and then we've got business models such as sharing or multimodal transport. Here, we're really trying to make sure that people uh, will move away from a single use occupancy, but try to see if we can have sharing models where we increase the, the utilization of a car. Today, a car tends to be parked 95% of the time. So let's increase the utilization of the assets we create. So by designing a car where the materials are reused and kept within the system, what you're doing is you're preserving the energy that went into making that car. You're keeping it in the system for longer. Um, and so, yeah, and in doing that, you're also avoiding new car production and also avoiding landfill and incineration. Mm -hmm. 
So in, in other words, from the very design stage, we should think about how to minimize the materials used, how to maximize the usage when the product, or in this case, car is used, and then think about how to make sure that well, at the end of life, everything comes back and stays in the system to be recirculated. Yes, exactly. And I think another interesting point as well is material choice. Things like bio-based materials um, sometimes even have a negative emissions impact compared to uh, materials that are more based from fossil fuel sources or finance sources. Um, and so bioplastic can have a, can have a carbon sink uh, potential. Mm -hmm. So even considering bio-based bio products can be a way of, uh, of mitigating. So when we look at construction here, bamboo is a, is a nice mm -hmm. example because it's, it, is, it, is, it is regenerative, it is just as strong as steel, it has a acts as a carbon sink. So that's these are also interesting things to consider consider when you design products. Mm, okay, and moving to the biological side. So on the biological side, one th I think a good example there is uh, regenerative agriculture. So regenerative agriculture here is really about using natural uh, farming practices. Practices. It's about crop rotation, animal rotation. It's about moving away from synthetic fertilizers and using more organic fertilizers, uh, moving away from heavy machinery, even tillage. Tillage tends to create a lot of disturbance to the soil. When you, when you disturb the soil, you emit, the soil emits CO2. So it's avoiding uh, practices that disturb the soil. It's about also nut looping nutrients back into the soil so you um, uh, regenerate uh, the soil. So you create, in the end, healthier soils. You increase the fertility. The water retention capacity is higher. The biological activity is, is, is healthy. And doing that, you are preserving the carbon sequestration uh, ability of soils. Um, and I think, in, so uh, Indigo Ag, um, a company has like estimated, for example, that um, today, so today's uh, soil organic content, um, so the, 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 the amount of nutrients that is, that is in the soil is around 1%. And if we were able to regenerate the soils to what it used to be in pre-industrial times, so increasing it to 3%, that alone will allow us to um, soak up around 1 trillion tons of, of, of carbon from the atmosphere. So this really helps show the importance of um, keeping our soils healthy through mm. natural practices. Mm. So now that we've seen the examples, so what else have we found and we talked about in the climate paper? Um, so in terms of the focus of the paper, so mm -hmm. right now we've kind of set the scene with the 55-45. Uh, the paper hasn't modeled the entire 45. We've, we have looked at five key areas that play a very important role that, have, that emit also quite a lot of CO2. Uh, we've looked at industry, so specifically steel, cement, aluminum, and plastic. And then when we look at the agricultural, agriculture, forestry, and other land use sector, we've looked at food production. So we've modeled these five. And um, so here you see the, the pie chart I presented earlier on. We focus on those five materials. They contribute to around 31% of emissions of today's global emissions. And when we just look at those five key areas, uh, we apply circular economy principles. And uh, so the ones I just explained earlier on, designing out ways, keep materials in use, regenerate natural systems. When you apply those to these five key areas, a circular economy can help, can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by around 45%. So that is around 9.3 billion tons of CO2. The remaining 55% will have to come from other solutions like emerging technology. It's about you know, carbon, uh, carbon capture, um, but also about shifting diets. Um, and so the main message here is, you know, circular economy is part of the solution. It's, it's not by 2050, it's not necessarily going to solve climate change. Mm -hmm. it, it is part of the solution and we also need these other technologies to help us uh, close this gap when we're talking about uh, the production of materials, the production of food. And so this 9.3 billion tons is the equivalent of eliminating current emissions from all forms of transport globally. Wow. Mm. Great. What I find fascinating is that if we go back to the previous slide, just five, five things, so steel, cement, aluminium, plastic, and food, and they account for a third of all emissions, 31% of all emissions. Mm -hmm. 
and that we do need circular economy to address the challenge of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. That circular economy won't be, alone won't be enough. Exactly. Mm. So what else have you discovered or found in the paper? Were there any other key findings? Um, so, so this is so these findings that you see here. Um, the new aspect was that we extrapolated globally, but they've been based on previous reports. So, for those who are listening online, if you're very if you're interested as to how these were calculated, uh, I definitely welcome you to look at the report, the paper that we just launched. But they are based on these previous reports from material economics last in the past two years, but also the food report, and that really digs into, you know. Uh, what does a circular economy really look like in detail? Um, and in the paper, we just we, we strengthen that, that messaging, we amplify that messaging. Um, what we also looked at, which is, the, which is new, is, the, is how a circular economy can help uh, generate greater resilience against the effects of climate change. It's, a, it's an exciting topic. Mm -hmm. The link between circular economy and resilience has never really been made before in terms of in relation to climate change. And so we've kind of made a, an exploration on the topic and made a, made a call for, uh, for additional research on the topic. So one of the things we've looked at is supply chains and food. For food, this is, um, you know, there's a lot more reports on that and more research done on that where regenerating natural systems, for example, uh, as you create healthier soils, they're better able to retain water. If you can retain more water, then your flood risks decrease. Um, so that's one example. In times of drought, if you're able to retain better water, then you also your chance of higher yields is higher. So this is uh, one example that so these types of um, that type of research has to be done before. The from a business perspective, supply chains, this is something new. Um, there's a lot of information about business risks with climate change effect or from climate events or things like here we're looking specifically at physical risks. So the impact of floods, hurricanes, and storms, how does that impact supply chains? And what does the circular economy uh, do in terms of, um, is it possible that it's decreasing that, uh, the chance of these risks? So we've looked, for example, and what you can find in the paper is lithium ion batteries. Mm -hmm. So li lithium ion is an abundant material. We use lithium ion to make ba batteries for electric vehicles. Um, however, the lithium that is extracted from brines are only located, or mainly located, in Chile and Australia. So 60% of those uh, brine sources are in Chile and Australia, and they are quite important because they are more cost effective. Um, these areas are very much prone to floods, hurricanes, um, and storms. And, so, and, and then the, the challenge is that the manufacturing of these uh, batteries take place more in the northern hemisphere. So if your supply of lithium is disrupted by a flood, your mine is flooded or your transport routes are flooded or your harbor, there's a storm, you can no longer ship your lithium ion um, mm -hmm. to the manufacturing of those uh, batteries. So this puts a risk to your business. And in a circular economy, we're trying to stimulate um, reuse, remanufacturing, recycling. So when you do that, you're diversifying your supply. So you're able to receive components from from your customers, and therefore you're not only decoupling your dependence on uh, raw materials, yeah. you know, virgin ma raw materials, but you're decoupling it from um, possible raw materials that are vulnerable to climate change. So by doing that, you're spreading your risk, um, and therefore uh, able to, 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 to be more resilient against those impacts. And so uh, there's a recent um, innovation that took place by Acceleron, who's created a battery that can uh, be remanufactured and reused and has been able to extend the lifetime of that battery to 25 years. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, it means that if something happens in your supply of lithium, um, then you're still able to continue your operations. This is just one example. It's not that not all circular economy uh, measures lead to greater resilience at all, but it is an interesting relationship. and. Um, and therefore, we hope there will be more research uh, being done on, on, on that topic. And it brilliantly illustrates the very premise of the circular economy, which is about achieving the economic prosperity while decoupling from the consumption of precious resources. Exactly. Yes, indeed. OK, so I think this is the time where we can move to the questions yeah. and see what questions we've got. 
All right, so there is a clarifying questions about um, the industry figures considered, oh, okay, so Masquire is asking, do the industry figures consider recycled materials or are they from the extraction of materials from ore? Mm, I'm trying to figure out whether the reference is on the 5545 or whether this is on the modeling. So I guess if I just, um, when we look at the 5545, the industry, those industry figures, the emissions don't. This is purely the production of steel, for example, uh, the emissions that arise when you produce those materials. Um, the extraction of materials, so if, again, if we look at that 5545 split mm -hmm. and we look at the share of industry, um, the extraction of materials is not included. So that would be even an underestimate. The ex and I guess we're going a little bit on, into details, but the extraction of fuel is part of that 55. And so, and also to explain maybe a bit of background on how this 55, 45 uh, percent mm -hmm. was made. These, this data is pretty much based on the IPCC report, um, the 2014 report, so the fifth, ass fifth assessment one. Um, and so this data you can find back in the report. Um, and the only thing we've done is a bit of a reclassification to help illustrate uh, what can be tackled by renewable energy and what is really challenging to tackle renewable energy. And so this is how this bit has been done. And I think what's interesting to note is, you know, we're not the only ones who have done this. Um, the International Resource Panel, for example, has um, uh, published a report and also mentioned the split and uh, how you make the split really depends on what you consider is part of which half. Yeah. All right, and then Marianne is asking if you could say a bit more on how the industrial share of the budget was estimated. Yeah, so here I would have to point you to the paper because this is quite detailed technical and technical. It is, yeah. it is based, so this is, the modeling is made by material economics and um, this is based on a, in, on a research paper and you will find the link uh, in the paper underneath that diagram. When you see the carbon budget, there's a reference source and it's based on that. And it's, yeah, it's important to know this carbon budget, um, how you calculate, there's a lot of differences in the numbers as to what do you, how do you, it's an estimation that you make and depending on the assumptions you make, this number will vary. So yeah, it's, it is a good question. Mm. And then a slightly different question. So Lara Smith is asking if we think that it is the designer's responsibility to incorporate these ideas into the new product. So think about how their products could reduce the greenhouse gas production. Yeah, greenhouse so gases. again, also great question. I think designers are really a key player in this. It's about um, design in, the, in, the, in, in, in not just the design of a product, but also how do you design supply chains? Um, how do you, even collection systems, you know, designing a city that allows you to recollect products. So design plays a role in, in many parts. It is critical if you want to shift the system because by designing a car that you can remanufacture and recycle allows it to be remanufactured and recycled. If you have a business model that stimulates, that collects materials and stimulates the reuse, but you have not designed it to be recyclable or you cannot even disassemble it, then you've got a problem. So design is critical there um, uh, in order to be able to effectively reuse, remanufacture, but also in terms of the material choices that you make. Let's consider renewable materials uh, where, where it makes sense. Yes. Um, um, so yeah, it, it, is, it plays an important role. And what I would add as well is that it's hard to find purely circular products because it cannot be isolated from the system. And the mm -hmm. system we operate in is still linear. So we not only need to think about the products where mm -hmm. the designer's role comes in, but we also need to think about the larger system that the product operates in, which yeah. is more the responsibility of the company itself, because you need to think about infrastructure, for instance, exactly. how you will get that thing back. Mm -hmm. You need to think about the business model, how you can reuse exactly. it over and over again, and then think about what you'll do at the end of life. So yes, and it's not only designer's responsibility, yeah. it's also the larger company. Absolutely. Yeah, and everybody has a, a role to play. Policymakers have a role to play to make sure that, that they get that we put in place enabling policies. Um, you know, one of the issues, a lot of the issues is that weight, it's very hard to reuse waste. So where, where it makes sense in terms of uh, find, creating standards that allow you to remanufacture and reuse certain products. 
Um, so that, that policies play an enabling role. Investors, in terms of finding business yeah. models um, that are, you know, that make financial sense. Um, and yeah, and also academia in terms of research and also people in general, um, you can also play, you know, play your own role there. Yeah, as consumers by making yeah. their choices. So, uh, another question we have from Claire is, can you please also talk a little bit about the state of the circular economy as relating to the fashion industry? And do we have any updated statistics on the greenhouse gas emissions in relation to the fashion industry? We may not. I don't think we have any updated uh, data th on that. I mean, currently we have the Make Fashion Circular Initiative. Um, so that's, that is the most, this is a report we, we, we launched I think last year. Mm -hmm. um, so there we've got, in fact, what's important, interesting to say is that every report we've launched in a way in terms of um, when we look at uh, nationals or countries and um, so China, India, when we looked at Europe, in each of those reports we have published what circular economy measures, um, what are the key circular economy opportunities and how much reduction in greenhouse gas emissions these can make. So there we've looked not only at the 45 but also at the 55. So the role of renewable energy in combination to designing, let's say, buildings that can be disassembled and creating materials that can be reused or manufactured. So there we've looked at the complete picture and you can find data there. Um, but yes, we don't, we have, we don't have the up-to-date numbers. Um, but I guess from, from the fashion perspective, for perspective, I think one thing that we do say is re reusing, uh, doubling the amount of doubling the amount of uh, usage of your clothes leads to a reduction of 44% in greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. wow. um, so that's an example. Reuse here plays a very big role because you preserve all the energy that went from extracting, from growing the crops to, yes. to making the fibers, to, to making the fabric, then making the clothes, uh, logistics, uh, all the way to retail. Um, you are avoiding all of that um, by reusing your clothes. Um, so that, yeah, that plays an important role. And then of course, you've got the supply chains, uh, energy efficiency is critical there. And um, so yeah, in terms of the textile one, also I mean, the, the textile, well, we have a report on China that we had published uh, also last year. There, there's a chapter on textiles and there you have also some data if you would find that interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and then we have another question, which I understand most of the research is geared towards large businesses, given their overall impact. But how can the little guys or small and medium enterprises contribute? Hmm. Well, I think small businesses have a, an exciting opportunity to, to stimulate innovation. Mm. Um, so you're, you have that freedom to innovate, and freedom to pilot new ideas, which bigger companies, it's a bit difficult to, 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 to do. Um, you can start, you can reinvent completely the, the design of a product, the infrastructure that is in place. Um, so that, I always find that exciting with more startups and emerging innovators about how can you design, let's say, a product that is recyclable, reusable, remanufacturable, that you can, what kind of business models can you put in place to ensure that these materials are returned and um, you know, how, do, how does that contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Um, so yeah. Mm. And I think at this point we can perhaps stop sharing the slides as well and just as we continue to converse between ourselves. Uh, another question that has just come in is the role of the consumer. So has the paper covered in any way the role of the consumers and how what they could do in order to tackle the climate change and reduction of emissions? Um, so the paper hasn't looked into that, unfortunately, but in terms of what uh, the consumer can do, there's a lot that can be done. So in terms of even like, if we look at uh, car ownership today, you know, 95% of, if you own a car 95% of the time, it's parked. So considering things like using public transport or sharing um, businesses that share, share cars, uh, really can help you not only contribute to a circular economy because you're keeping the materials within the system, you're, you're maximizing, maximizing the utilization of your of assets, but by doing that, you're also reducing greenhouse gas. And so going for uh, choosing a public transport over, let's say, a single occupancy uh, vehicle can allow you to save around 80% of greenhouse gas. So that is a huge contribution you can make just by 
um, choosing public transport, let alone cycling, which is obviously cycling and walking is <laughs> the best option. But, um, and then of course, then that, you know, in terms of the equipments that you have at home, the drills, the landmowers, the, the, you know, these equipments that you don't necessarily use every single day, but even being part of a sharing platform where in a neighborhood where people share their appliances, so you don't have to buy a new one. Every time you buy a new one, then you're incentivizing the production of all these new materials that, yeah. So um, a drill, for example, is used for an average of seven minutes in its entire lifetime. Um, so, so yeah, that's an example of in terms of even clothes, you could be part of sharing or renting, or if you have, let's say, you know, a gown that you, you've only used twice, you could either um, sell it for second hand or things like that. Um, yeah, and you see food, food is also another one, you know, um, avoiding food waste at home. So even when you are recycling and, and separating your waste, you're, by doing that, you're stimulating recycling and therefore uh, avoiding incineration and possible landfilling. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the recipes you make, I mean, that takes a bit more effort to figure out what kind of food uh, emit less carbon, but even choosing things that are locally grown or that are, that are organic or, or made through regenerative practices, um, eating a bit less meat. I mean, all these things contribute to, um, um, to, to having less emissions mm -hmm. around the planet. And I think when I think about individual choices, yes, we can reconsider what we do as consumers, mm -hmm. but we can also think about our sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm a consumer, but most likely I also work somewhere and what influence do I have in my organization? Yeah. Or what influence do I have in my community or society in general? And how I can bring in this conversation, how can I start yeah. talking about the circular economy, especially now that we know that there are clear links to the climate mm -hmm. change. So maybe I can help my business to transition to the circular economy or maybe I can bring it into the conversations yeah. elsewhere. Yeah, so absolutely. these are all actions that everyone can do as well. Yeah. Okay. And we have another question from Mir Peer, and I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your name correctly. So the question is, are you putting some practical examples in the paper or are you telling the enterprises how to really do this? Hmm. So this paper was more about emphasizing the opportunity of a circular economy. So not we have um, for each of these principles are you know certain circular strategies. Uh, so eliminating waste or uh, reusing products and materials, recycling. For each of those, we give some practical examples just to illustrate how much CO two could be reduced, or and especially you know how many materials can be uh, how how much uh, new virgin materials can be avoided by implementing certain uh, measures. So that we do do, we have two deep, two deep dives. So we've looked at industry and food, that's the key focus. Um, within industry, we've done um, two deep dives for uh, uh, looking at the built environment and, um, and mobility. And there is, we've gone into a little bit more detail to illustrate, um, let's say if you were going to, in the design of a car, like if you would eliminate waste, if you would reuse, uh, and when you manufacture car parts, um, if you would increase the durability of the car significantly, if you would imply, you know, stimulate the sharing of cars, if you would implement all of these things, how much CO2 could you reduce? So that for that, for example, it can lead to, when you implement those opportunities, it can lead to a reduction of 70%. So there, you know, there, for example, it's a, we do go into a little bit more depth in the paper there. Um, to illustrate the potential and do the similar for, for the built environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think in terms of a practical example, we know is a great example. There's, a, there's numerous case studies about that. But we know designs, you know, has a remanufacturing plant in choisy le roi in France. And, you know, they have really stimulated this whole remanufacturing of their cars, designing cars that you can remanufacture and reuse and recycle. So I think 43% of those cars can be reused, 48% can be recycled. A share of that is valorized. And then together, that also leads to a reduction of around 80% of greenhouse gas. So you do find some of these things. I think for the foundation, I think we would be very keen and interested to get a bit more case studies. Mm -hmm. All these circular economy case studies we have today all contribute to a certain degree to, to, to reducing greenhouse gas. So it's also about communicating that and say, and measuring what is the impact of of your business model and communicated your contribution to reducing greenhouse gas. I think that would be just very valuable. And I think we will, we are, we will try to, 
emphasize this further and finding good case studies to illustrate that. Mm. Yeah. And I like this idea that we sometimes use that circular economy provides like a map. We know our destination that we want to travel towards, but then mm -hmm. each of us or each company needs to figure out how exactly to get there. Yes. But keeping the three principles mm -hmm. in mind as the guiding uh, principles or the guiding questions mm -hmm. and make sure that these principles inform the decisions you make in your business or how to design yeah. out waste and pollution and how exactly. to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, how to keep products and materials in use and to make sure that the energy stored is, is stored, yeah. the carbon stored remains yeah. in these products. And we're generating national systems. It's yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 useful guidelines. Yeah, and exactly what I guess what you mentioned here is, is that circular economy has multiple benefits. Mm. So aside from reducing greenhouse gases, there's a really a strong economic model behind that. Um, even the creation of jobs, um, the, the impact that it has on the environment. So it has a potential of of tackling several global challenges and even uh, meet some some of your SDGs. So, so it's also kind of seeing it from that lens as well. It's a, it's a, you can see the circular economy as a delivery mechanism so for several objectives, whether that's climate change or uh, prosperity, um, well-being, and things like that, yeah. Which leads me to another quite interesting question. So does every circular economy initiative contribute to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions? Mm. Well, that's a tricky one. Um, I think the paper looks at it more from a high level perspective, but um, I would say you have to always be a bit careful with the way you look at it. Um, so um, I would say yes, but <laughs> I think, um, um, so for example, when we talk about a circular economy, we, we talk about designing things for reuse, remanufacturing and repair. Uh, what happens is that you may be avoiding the production of new materials, but you are stimulating your, your operational activities increase. So your energy demand for repair and manufacturing, for example, increase as a result, possibly. Um, and so, yeah, so this factoring these things. And so that energy that is used to make, to keep these equipments going, um, or increasing the utilization of your buildings means your electricity bill might be higher than it would usually be. Um, so yeah, then thinking about, I guess at 55%, you know, that renewable energy and, and, and seeing, look at the system as a whole and not isolated. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also it's just in general, it's a, it is a challenging thing. It's just materials you can choose for bio-based materials because it's ha they have a carbon sequestration potential, but can you recycle it? Can you biodegrade it? If you cannot, then does that mean you're landfilling it or incinerating? And if you are, that emits CO2. So I think it's important to look at it from a system perspective. Um, and so, yeah, and I think in terms of uh, even um, resilience, I think that's something that we've also looked into with, does, this, does every circular economy measure need to increase resilience? And here, for example, that's not necessarily the case. So it is also sometimes a bit context specific or taking the whole system into approach. But here, a good example is cities. You know, we tend to say with circular economy, it's about also being more productive with the materials that you use. So designing compact cities means that you're avoiding urban sprawl. If you're avoiding urban sprawl, you're avoiding the construction of new infrastructure, of new buildings. Um, and so you're uh, more efficient, more productive. And it also stimulates the use of sharing business models. So this is in line with the circular economy, mm -hmm. the making of more compact cities. From a climate change perspective and resilience, a compact city makes you more vulnerable to external shocks. So from a resilience part, it's, um, you know, it's definitely not every circular economy measure leads to uh, greater resilience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then we have another question from Neil Sanero. Two. And it's, it's a very long question. So basically the question is about the calls to actions for companies and different sectors and governments. Mm -hmm. Do we have anything like that? We, well, we have a, a whole chapter devoted to that, the call for action, and we split it under so multilateral bodies, um, uh, governments, uh, national, uh, regional, local. Um, we looked at academia. Um, and investors, um, you know, climate change is a global problem. We need everyone needs to play its, its part to be able to for us to really meet these targets. Um, in, some, in terms of government specifically, 
um, there's a lot that can happen for so in terms of procurement even just using procurement criteria that allow products to be recycled reused uh, um, plays a role and in doing that you're contributing to a reduction in greenhouse gas it's our you know it's also understanding the link of when you're applying circular economy principles you're often also um, having an impact on other areas mm -hmm. just in, in the climate you know reducing greenhouse gas is a great example um, yeah, and uh, let me see in terms of policy, what's important is, well, I guess one thing we're really pushing for is really to make sure circular economy is high up in the international agenda, um, you know, from the UN perspective that we understand as well that circular economy, applying circular economy measures helps you meet these climate targets. Um, and, and also from, I guess, from a national level, having strategies in place, visions in place that take into consideration, consideration of circular economy and how this is really, uh, you know, a delivery mechanism for achieving your targets. Mm -hmm. Also for businesses, measuring your progress. If you have circular economy business models in place, measuring how, how much CO2 is being avoided, it helps you communicate your contribution as well in terms of these targets. Um, so that's an important, an important part, uh, but also finance is an important role, financing governments, public organizations have uh, the power, well, some cities have the power to, to really uh, finance projects and initiatives that are involved with circular economy projects that are, and especially if they have shown to considerably reduce greenhouse gas, there's, there's a power there. To, to use finance to enable mm. these transitions. Regulations, putting regulations in place um, that, you know, either to, to enable the recycling, uh, to incentivize collection, so all these things. So, so, yeah, depending whether that's national or local, that depends really much on the geography, or on the context of what kind of powers you have at hand to enable these opportunities. Mm. Yeah. So do you think that climate or do you think the circular economy will be on the COP's agenda or will be mentioned in the upcoming COP? I hope so. I think that would be, uh, a, well, it's an important one and it's, there's a lot of discussion already this year around, stuff, around climate change. Um, and we are hoping to really bring it forward and to make sure that this is part of the discussion and, and that people see circular economy as being part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about what can we do to tackle climate change, that the circular economy is part of the debate um, and that this understanding of that you know that pie chart of that 55 versus the 45 let's look at the full picture let's look at not only the production of, of electricity and the consumption of it in terms of you know the transportation buildings but let's look at how we produce goods how we produce food and what is that contribution to to, to climate change and, and how, what can we do to reduce it and it will require um, all the innovations and ideas that we have today to really meet this 1.5 degree target. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's do it all together, I would mm -hmm. say. And I just recent, recently listened to a podcast with Christiana Figueres mm -hmm. and she was interviewing CEO of IKEA and they actually mm -hmm. talked about circularity in the context yeah. of addressing the climate change. Great. So it's, yeah. a re it's great to see these connections already happening. Yes. Yeah. And I think Christiana Figueres was one of the people endorsing the Yeah, she has well. endorsed the paper. Yeah. yeah. Any other name interesting names endorsing the paper um in, you mean in terms of the endorsements yeah um so the Euro european investment bank um we've had we have had a number of experts as well um, um from the resilience aspect that have looked into the paper um so adelphi uh, we have we have involved them in the making of the paper acclimatize as well uh, they know has given us uh, as a lot, well, one of our longest partners that we have here at the foundation has made a, um, a quote for us. So yeah, we have approached a number of people and I definitely welcome everyone to take a look mm -hmm. at the paper and immerse yourself in it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we are approaching the end of the webinar. We have about five minutes left. So if you have any burning questions, we can still try to capture them. Um, maybe one or two final questions. Uh, what about the carbon capture and how has it been covered in the paper? Um, so, so there's, a lot, of, so there's a, lot, a lot of hype in general around carbon capture because the idea of carbon capture storage is that you can continue with today's production system 
and use this technology to really capture it. So avoid that CO2 from, from, from escaping and mm -hmm. you keep it in a confined environment. And in certain cases, you'd be able to even reuse that, that, that CO2 and, and use it to make products. So it is a very exciting opportunity. Um, However, from a circular economy perspective, we really first, uh, we try to move away from this linear economy, this, this very extractive and resourceful economy. We're trying to go towards um, designing systems that are less wasteful um, and where we produce multiple types of benefits, whether that's economic, um, environmental, or social. Um, and so, as I don't know if you remember, but in the diagram, for those four materials that we modeled, we had a reduction of 9.3 billion tons of CO2. Um, the remaining 55% uh, has to come from other technologies. And so carbon capture there is, is a very important role there to, to really implement. Um, I think the main message is, is not to center ourselves on only one um, opportunity or one technology. It's kind of using the, the wide array that we, the wide array of, of, of technologies and, and solutions to help us reach that um, so yeah, mm. and uh, Mature Economics published a report uh, this year looking at the industrial transformation for the European uh, Union. Um, and there they've done three different um, uh, pathways to net zero and circular economy is one, but they've also looked at what if uh, carbon capture played a more important role, what would this mean? And so this is definitely a report to look into if you're interested in carbon capture and what that transition Great. pathway would look like. Mm. Um, so now that we talked about the links between the climate change and the circle economy, and I think we covered quite a bit of ground. So if there were a few key takeaways you'd mm -hmm. like our audience to take with them after this webinar, yeah. what would they be? Um, I would say um, let's look beyond renewable energy. It is critical. It is very important for us to meet our 1.5 degree target. Um, it can help us tackle that 55% of energy, which forms part of the energy sector. But let's not forget the overlooked emissions, which, are the, which is that 45%. And what can we do in the way we design and produce our products in terms to help reduce that? And so that, I guess the second messaging would be, you know, the circular economy can play a very important role in looking at both at the 55 and the 45. And so um, let's, let's, no, no. Let's you know innovate, implement these opportunities, but also let's communicate as well uh, the impact that uh, search and circular economy strategies can have in helping us meet those climate targets. So it, so we can help um, show the the opportunity up here. Um, so yeah. Mm. And also, the circular economy can not only contribute to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, but it has an array of yes, other benefits exactly. as well that can contribute to other sustainable development goals and yes. has certain business benefits. So exactly. Yeah. It's a way to future proof the future proof the business for the companies. Exactly. <laughs> and if I were if I were to add another takeaway is or rather a call to action is to encourage our audience and those that listen to us to Take these messages and have a conversation with people around you. Talk to someone in your family, talk to someone in your organization, talk about these linkages between the climate change and the circular economy. And so we are, we are going to wrap up here and thank you everyone for tuning in today to listen to this webinar. I hope it has been useful and it has been recorded. So it will be shared afterwards on our YouTube channel and we will share the link with you by email as well. And if you have any comments generally for the webinar, how it went, or if you have any ideas for the future topics that we could cover, you can type them in the chat box and we will make sure that we capture them. And the next webinar will take place in January and we will announce, them, announce it through our website and social media channels. And thank you, Suki, very much for joining us today. And please make sure you well, remember that you can find the climate paper on our website and you can also explore our Circular Economy Learning Hub at www.ellenmacarthurfoundation.org slash explore. And also next week we're starting our online festival DIF, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's DIF. And you can find the full schedule and tune into sessions at thinkdiff.co 
So we really encourage you to tune in and there will be another conversation about climate there as well. So you'll be able to continue exploring this topic. And that's it for now, really. So wish you all a lovely day wherever you are, because I know that we have very diverse audience tuning in from all over the world. So wish you all a lovely morning or a lovely day or a lovely evening. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me here.